people. I hope you're doing well, my delovelies, because we're about to get into something that may contain science. Brain in a vat science. The idea of a brain in a vat, a brain devoid of sensory organs or other corporeal accessories, is a favorite thought experiment platform for philosophers. But because we live in the future, brains in a vat are also real. We call them cerebral organoids, and yes, that's a much less catchy name, but look, scientists aren't marketing strategists, what do you want from me? A study published in Nature Electronics, though, may catapult these uninspiringly named cerebral organoids into the public eye, where real marketing strategists can do their work, as this study reports on a brain grown in a vat that functions as a machine learning machine. Look. I'm not the marketing strategist either, I'm just here to tell you about brains in a vat. But first, we should talk about what organoids actually are, so that we can understand what cerebral organoids are capable of. Organoids are simplified, three-dimensional mini-organs produced in vitro, often from stem cells. Using various growth factors and signaling molecules, the cells are coaxed into differentiating into the various cell types required to make that particular organ. And from there, biology actually helps us out. In general, cells in culture tend to organize based on the kind of cell they think they are. Blood vessel cells form mini vessel tubes in a petri dish, intestinal stem cells create crypts and villi, and so on. So long as you understand which cell types do what in a given organ, and you know how to correctly differentiate stem cells into those cell types, and to be clear, None of those things are easy. But if you can do them, you can theoretically create your own little organ. The fairy idea of growing organs in a dish may give some people the ick, but it's not inherently all that different from the two-dimensional cell culture we do all the time in labs all over the world. It's wildly more difficult and complex than a lot of those cell cultures, sure, but there's real value to it. It lets us study development. Like, wait, we actually couldn't get these cells to cooperate the way they do in real life. There must be some factors we don't know about that make it work in real tissue. Organoids let us study pathologies that are difficult to model or to obtain appropriate samples for. We're even performing clinical trials of personalized medicine using organoids derived from patients' cells to predict their personal response to given treatments. But now, to the cerebral organoid in particular. Turns out we've been studying and producing cerebral organoids for the past 10 years. So brain in a vat is not anything new on its own. We used those early organoids to study the mechanisms that lead to microencephaly, a developmental condition in which the head and brain do not grow to normal size. So, have scientists been secretly creating full-on human brains and vats for 10 years and no one told us? No. And before we get to this paper, which focuses on computing with cerebral organoids, which, spoilers, showcases the power of these little babies, I want to talk about their limitations to understand why we know they're not creating full-on human brains and fats. To make a cerebral organoid, stem cells are taken and induced to differentiate into neuroectoderm. In embryonic development, you have the three germ layers. The endoderm that makes your digestive tract and lungs, the mesoderm, which makes your muscles, cardiovascular system, connective tissue, and spleen, among other things, and your ectoderm, which ultimately becomes skin and brain. Why is that important for our brain in a vat? It highlights an important limitation of these cerebral organoids. They have no vascular system. Cerebral organoids are made from neuroectoderm. You can't make blood vessels out of that. That's some mesoderm stuff. To get these organoids their brain food, since blood vessels aren't taking it to them, the organoids are put in a rotational bioreactor filled with nutrients. Basically a whirly gig that uses physics to try to get those nutrients throughout the little mini brain. But without blood vessels to transport nutrients and oxygen, it means that size is a major limitation of these cerebral organoids. 
If it's too big, then the center of the organoid won't be getting those mission critical ingredients. I mean, nutrients and oxygen, they're kind of important. And if you don't have them, the tissue will die off. Now, do I bring this up because I am a nerd for the vascular system? Yes, absolutely. Look, I'm like one of those public transit nerds, but for vasculature. It's really important infrastructure and we need to respect it. But also, the lack of vasculature puts a ceiling on how big these organoids can get, and so it also puts a ceiling on the complexity. Like, my desktop computer has a zillion times more processing power than a computer of the same form factor from 20 years ago. But that's because we can make transistors smaller, fit more of them onto a chip. We can't do the same thing with neurons. Of course, birds have awesome, smaller, more energy efficient neurons, but what can I say, they're just cooler. So there's a finite amount of computational power in these organoids that's bottlenecked by their size, which tends to max out at four to five millimeters with roughly as many neurons as the average honeybee. And as we'll talk about with this study, it may not be enough to perform the zillions of advanced functions that human brains are capable of, but it turns out it's still enough to do some pretty impressive stuff when compared to their silicon neural network counterparts. Because while I've been talking about the biology of all this, the paper itself, I remind you, was published in Nature Electronics. And the computation is front and center here. I mean, I'm sitting here amazed at how scientists could build a high density multi-electrode array that can interface with a brain organoid, receiving inputs and sending outputs. But this study's authors are like, yeah, yeah. No, yeah, we built an organoid we can interface with, but now let's see how it can perform on a speech recognition task, which is a classic use case for machine learning, specifically reservoir computing, and also Speech recognition is something my brain does every day, so eh, there's a lot of crossover compatibility here. Naturally, the four millimeter organoid does not have ears, so the first task is to take the audio, in this case, 240 clips of isolated Japanese vowels pronounced by eight different male speakers, and convert it to a series of spatiotemporal electro pulses, which I mean, admittedly, is the kind of mechanical stimulus to electrical signal that our audio periphery does for us. So it is kind of exactly the thing that our brains are well equipped to handle as input. The researchers sent those pulses through the multi-electrode array, then measured the organoid's electrical firing patterns in response to those stimuli. So Loki, my favorite part of this entire study is that then they have to decode the organoids' responses, and the best way to do that is with a machine learning algorithm. So we send the electrical pulses to the organoid to see if it can do machine learning tasks, then send the output back to a silicon computer to figure out how to process it using machine learning. After the initial exposure to the spatiotemporal sequences built on the audio data to train the silicon side algorithm as much as anything, the organoid neural network was put to the test. The initial results before training were eh, fine at about 50%. That is to say, the organoid's electrophysiological response consistently matched the vowel offered about half the time. But there's a reason that computer neural network algorithms are called that, and it's because brains, even little brain organoids, are really, really, really good at adaptation and learning. They ran through the series of audio clips about four more times, four training epochs. Now, after that training, low brain comes in with 78% accuracy, which absolutely spanks the performance of an artificial neural network without long short-term memory and nearly matches an artificial neural network with long short-term memory that was given 50 epochs of training to low brain's four. And I keep calling the organoid neural network little brain, but frankly, that's because I cannot accept that the authors called it brain aware. Seriously, throughout the whole paper, brain aware. 
marketing strategists. We need you. Anyway, that atrocity of a name aside, what drives this organoid neural network's performance boost with training is synaptic plasticity. Reorganizing its functional connectivity is the killer feature of brains. And we know that because organoids treated with a blocker to prevent synaptic plasticity barely improved their performance with training. Now, I've memed on humans for how we invent little metrics that make our brains seem super impressive when compared to other mammals, but truthfully, this is a reminder that organic brains are incredible, powerful computational devices. This little organoid, just a few millimeters in size, can legitimately compete with full-on modern artificial neural networks with 12 times the training. And when you put it like that, yeah, I see why so many computer scientists look to the brain for algorithmic inspiration. And these studies authors do frame their work in how good this organoid neural network is as a computer. They highlight the 20 watts of brain power versus 8 million watts to drive a comparable artificial neural network. Even in their conclusions, while they talk about improving the ele organoid electrode interface, they're also focused on optimizing the power requirements of the organoid neural network and its bioreactor. In other words, these are researchers looking to make bioneural gel packs like something out of Star Trek using organoids to ultimately reduce the power cost of certain types of computationally expensive operations. Now, I don't think those costs in the paper account for the months of investment required to grow cerebral organoids in vitro. Although cerebral organoids last a surprisingly long time in culture, these little brains also take their sweet time to develop. But the whole idea is more viable than I expected, honestly. There's tons that can be improved on the biology side, and there are tons of biologists working on just that, as well as ethicists standing right over their shoulder. But as biologists focus on building better organoids and organs on a chip, including cerebral ones, it's pretty cool to see just how much engineers can do with the limited organoids we can produce right now. And in the meantime, Feel free to be a little smug about that brain of yours. It can do things computers can't even dream of. <laughs>